Good morning, everybody. Uh, if we could, people could take their seats and we'll get started. Uh, I'm Maren Lead at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I'm very honored to have, uh, you can't hear me? I'm sorry, could, could, is there, are the mics on? No. No. Okay, I, somebody gets sitting in the front said she couldn't. Okay, there we go. Uh, Marn Lead, I'm a senior advisor here at C uh, CSIS, and I am uh, honored to be here today with Dr. Arthi Prabhakar and General Rooster Schmidl, Lieutenant General Rooster Schmidl, to have a conversation about innovation and uh, future military operations. You have their bios in front of you, um, so I won't delve into them in depth, but. Um, the short story is they both have long histories, both in assignments and in practice, in leading and managing uh, innovation in a variety of contexts. Um, Dr. Prabhakar, principally from the technological side, um, but also as a venture capitalist trying to seed innovation and, um, and identify it. Uh, and now, as the director of DARPA, um, laying out the, the future course for, I think, what most people see as the organization that is the, who has the most direct mission for uh, thinking hard about technology innovation for the department as a whole. Um, General Schmidl has sort of come from the other side as an operator, um, a marine aviator who has been deeply involved in a number of both organizational uh, and <coughs> operational uh, experiences where he's led and participated in uh, attempts for the operational force to try to conceive of new ways of doing business and employ technologies uh, as part of that effort. So I, I think a, an exceptionally well-balanced uh, panel and, and hopefully will foster a very rich conversation this morning. Um, I want to make a quick note about the most important thing, which is food. Um, at the end of this panel, it will be time to grab lunch before continuing on in your day. And is an, in an attempt to better manage people flow, our group is supposed to take the elevators down to the concourse level where we will be getting our food and others will go elsewhere. But so anyway, if you can just, when you leave here, go down to the concourse to grab lunch before uh, heading into the afternoon sessions. And as always, if you could turn off your uh, ringers, that would be much appreciated. And when we get to q and A, I'm going to ask Dr. Bacher to make some opening remarks, and then General Schmidl will follow her, um, and then we'll open it up to everybody. So if you could briefly identify yourself and then uh, ask your question as succinctly as possible, it would be much appreciated. So, Dr. Bacher, over to you. Great. Thank you so much for the chance to do this. This is Rooster and I get to do a duet, which will be a, a delight. <laughs> Um, let's see. Um, I think many folks know DARPA, but uh, to review quickly, uh, our mission is Breakthrough Technologies for National Security. That is unchanged um, since we were founded in 1958 in the wake of Sputnik. Quickly uh, realized that the best way to pursue our mission of, of preventing technological surprise was to create some surprises of our own. And so that's still very much why we come to work in the morning. In 2014, what that means is um, preparing for a world in which we have a plethora of different types of threats and challenges. Um, it's no longer the Cold War where there's one monolithic adversary that uh, focuses all of our attention. So today we are, of course, concerned about the emergence of peer competitors and the actions of nation states. But, of course, we are also still daily confronted with terrorism and its links to uh, criminal activity around the world and linkages from those activities back to nation states. Uh, we're confronted uh, with uh, the emergence of new diseases like Ebola and other humanitarian challenges that occur uh, around the globe. And that bubbling pot of chronic but also acute challenges uh, that the department faces, those are the things that we worry about at DARPA as well. Because we're a technology agency, a lot of our focus is first thinking about the importance of global technology in empowering those threats that we face. And uh, that environment today is one that is radically different than the, than the, than the world in which DARPA was created. Uh, we no longer can assume that the technologies that we have access to give us decades of advantage over everyone else on the planet. And in fact, we see from 
uh, insurgents to sophisticated nation state capabilities, we see the use of very powerful globally available technology moving at a, a really rapid clip. Uh, and I think that creates an environment in which the, the technologies that we work on uh, need to uh, deal with that, that uh, new reality in a very different pace. Um, and so that's the context for our work. Uh, let me share with you three major themes for the work that we're doing at DARPA today. Much of our work today is about fundamentally rethinking complex military systems. There, uh, we recognize that in many, many um, aspects of what we do with military technologies today, uh, we're reaching the point of diminishing returns. And many of our highly sophisticated, highly capable systems are massive monolithic platforms that, yes, they're powerful, yes, they're capable, but they become point sources of vulnerability. They are extremely costly. They're very slow to build. They're very inflexible to operate. And over time, they are hostile to advances in the underlying technology. They're nearly impossible, it feels like, to upgrade. That's not going to cut it for the world that we're in and the pace at which technology is moving around the world today. So uh, in areas like rethinking air dominance, in rethinking how we use uh, the space domain, in rethinking our control of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, in many different areas, uh, also in the maritime domain, we're fundamentally rethinking the kinds of systems and architectures um, that, that we're building today to create a future where we have far more robust capabilities, but importantly, capabilities that can be built for fewer dollars, built more quickly, built to upgrade, uh, built to work in cooperative, uh, distributed fashion often uh, as a way to achieve those objectives. That's the character for a lot of the work that we're doing uh, across the agency. Uh, a second major theme at DARPA today is about dealing with information at massive scale. The information explosion that we all experience in our uh, civilian lives is uh, paralleled with the explosion of information taking place with the sensors and systems that we have in the military context. And uh, two key things emerge out of that, that that are important from our perspective. One is a recognition that uh, we are so reliant on information and information systems that uh, if unless we create a way to have a foundation of trust in our information and information systems, we're simply going to be, uh, cr we, we simply are going to continue to live with what I think is a, 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 an unreasonable vulnerability, uh, again, because of the reliance that we have on information systems. So cybersecurity and the use of the cyber domain uh, fundamentally changing our capabilities in that area is one major uh, area of focus for us at DARPA. A second is to realize that in that explosion of big data, are places where bad actors hide, but also enormous opportunities if we can start harnessing that information rather than just drowning in all of those bits. And so the, the opportunities for cloud analytics and big data, I think, are another important part of mastering the information explosion. <coughs> um, the third area for DARPA is one that is a perpetual part of our mission, which is to scour the research horizon and look for the places where we see the bubbling pot of, of research that's, that creates the foundations for the next generation of technological surprise. We're working on uh, a variety of things in that area, but one that I would particularly highlight today is the opportunities that emerge as biology is intersecting with the physical sciences and engineering and with information technology um, in the work that we're doing today on neurotechnologies, on synthetic biology, on working to outpace the spread of infectious disease. Uh, those are examples of some of the ways that we see uh, our ability to harness these new technologies, but also our ability to understand how their power could be used against us um, those are some of the aspects of uh, this business of always looking for the next seeds of technological surprise. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of the way we're thinking about uh, the future um, uh, of technology and its role in uh, changing our national security capabilities. Uh, we very much look at the world from the technology lens, and I think you know, very complementary to our colleagues in uniform and uh, turning it into real operational capability, which is when all of this gets real. So I'll stop with that. We can pursue any of that in, in the Great. discussion. Thank you.
Thanks, Thanks Rosie. That's, that's, that's a great lead-in. So what, what, uh, what Maren asked me to share with you a little bit is, is to talk a little bit about the sort of the culture of innovation and how we get from technolo technology, if you will, from some good ideas. How do we actually incorporate that into, a, into an organization? So the, the, the first thing that occurs to me is that we need to be, I think, um, uh, suitably informed by sort of some historical examples, right? So if you remember back at the, uh, in the beginning of the, uh, of the First World War, the doctrine about offensive tactics was ingrained in every Western army that there was, in spite of the fact that this thing called a machine gun had been invented, that, and it took a half a million casualties at the Somme before we changed the tactics. So just think about that. I mean, the, the scale, it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult for hierarchical organizations to incorporate that kind of change. And why is that? Well, because the people that get to the tops of hierarchical organizations, with the exceptions of occasionally, I mean, I'm living proof the Marine Corps has a sense of humor, but the, um, it, in order to do that, everything that you've done to be successful, to get to that higher level, is actually an impediment to the innovation that's required for that organization to continue to grow. And it, and it, and it's that kind of dichotomy that is that I think is something that we have to um, just have to be aware of. Uh, my experiences in uh, in running the, the this special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force, which did all of the experimentation back in the late '90s and early 2000s in the Marine Corps. It, it taught me a number of things, and one of them was that we could use technology to actually change culture. Uh, interestingly enough, there's two ways to do that. You could have a theological conversation that could go on for years and years and years about the reason why this particular organization should do things differently, or you can very cleverly insert technologies that are going to cause changes in the way that people do things and allow them to see things in a different manner. And, and I'll give you an example. We were looking at uh, distributed tactics, right, in the, on the battle space. And the thought process was, for instance, what I came to it, from where I came to it, was looking at the, at the evolution of, uh, of land warfare from the phalanxes in the, uh, in the Greek days where they all fought close together to the fact that organizations and, and, um, and uh, units began to move further and further apart. I then looked at my experience in aviation where, you know, way back in the day in the First World War, they used to fly very, very close to each other because they wanted to be able to see them. They used hand and arm signals to talk to each other. And then as technology allowed us to, we got further and further and further apart. And I noticed even going from certain type model series airplanes that I flew from the F-4 into the F-18 and beyond that we started getting further and further. And now we're so far apart that we sometimes don't even see each other out there. We couldn't conceive of that doctrinal change without the technology being there to, to, to drive the change. So that's just, a, just an example. And the trying to change the culture by saying, we're going to change this, is, I mean, that's the hardest thing to do. The other thing that's difficult in organizations is to create, in, in hierarchical organizations, like in a service, a, a culture of innovation that allows you to protect the creative, so to speak, that allows the folks that are actually really nugging away and trying to come up with these kinds of ideas that, that to provide and to create an atmosphere that is more sort of Google-like than it is Marine Corps-like, if you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's more... You know, that doesn't mean that you have to, I mean, I, I tried this, and it, unfortunately the people I worked for didn't think it was really funny to have people come into work in flip-flops and, and uh, Hawaiian shirts and stuff, just to try to, at any rate. But, but there are ways that you can try to create and to try to create an atmosphere in which people are inclined to take some of the technologies that Arthur just talked about and, and to sit there and actually think through, well, what could I do if I had that? So, so it's, it's a little bit of the what if, what could I do, and and what could that technology do uh, to change the way I look at the world? For example, uh, we shouldn't be surprised, and Dorothy and I talked about this the other day, we should not be surprised at the way ISIL has used social media. That shouldn't surprise us at all. As a matter of fact, we should have anticipated that. Another example is the uh, just prior to the First World War, with the advent of rail, in, and, and the train system in, in Europe allowed 
people to mobilize and move forces to the front lines at a rate that they'd never been able to do before. And what we didn't understand is that that same capability was going to box in the decision makers because they felt like they had to make a decision about going to war because if country X mobilizes, they'll be at the border before we can do anything about it. So there's just an example of a technology that of an unanticipated um, uh, outcome of, of a particular technology. So that's, you know, kind of in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I think that the concepts, and in some cases, the technology follows the concepts. You know, in the inner war years, the, which people love to talk about, but there's actually a lot of really fruitful things that we can learn from that, that the, uh, you know, everybody makes a, has made a big deal out of this concept of blitzkrieg, but the notion was really came from a lot of the constraints that were put on the Germans after the Treaty of Versailles about what they could and couldn't do. And so they're driving around in the Schwabian plane there with cars that had plywood on the side that said tank on it and uh, trying to fly airplanes around, which they couldn't for many years because of the treaty, that didn't have radios in them. And they were dropping things and putting white uh, uh, crosses on the tops of their vehicles. But when the wireless radio became practical and worked, they had a concept for doing combined arms training that allowed them to use that radio in a way that, that uh, Europe hadn't seen before. So there's an example of a concept, a way of doing things that you start to experiment with, with surrogates. When we first started these distributed operation experiments in the Marine Corps, we didn't have tablets like we do now. We called them end user devices. We didn't know any better. We, we, we were trying to develop a wireless internet, which I carried out to 29 Palms and had these little things about the size of my hand and we set them up on six foot platforms and pointed them at the formations of Marines so that we could get some wireless connectivity. And when we first did that and it didn't work, I, I backed up and I gave every one of the Marines out there a five by eight card and a pencil. And I said, draw on this card what you think you need to know from this system. And it was different than what we thought they needed to know. By a, they didn't want all the information we were producing. They wanted to know where they were, where their buddies were, and where we thought the enemy was. That's all they wanted. And they wanted to be able to rely on that information. So I took those cards and we conducted experiments. And we would change the cards out and give them a card and say, OK, here's what you know now. What, what could you do about it? And that helped us design, if you will, this wireless system that we, used eventually, that we eventually used. Now, it took many years for that to become part of the Marine Corps because it wasn't the way we'd been doing things in the past. And thanks to visionaries like uh, General Krulak, who was the commandant, who provided the top cover that allowed this, the institution to go forward, and we were able to do that. So, um, so that's just an example. We had a, uh, I'll give you one more example, and we'll throw it open to questions. We had a command and control system in this uh, operations center, and uh, I had some folks under contract to me from, I think it was Cal Poly, to build algorithmic learning agents to help us make decisions. And what I was trying to do is to get the agents to make sort of the housekeeping decisions so that we as humans could apply our intuition, if you will. And we used to bring the programmers, the people that built these agents, out to Quantico once every six or seven weeks, and we'd run a two-day CPX, a, a, a command post exercise, and they'd watch us operate, and we would tell them what the agent would tell us and that we liked or didn't like. You know, when we had a, for instance, if you tried to call a fire mission in on a friendly force that was within a couple hundred meters, you got these two big blue arrows on the, and they just started pointing at each other and flashing. It was a blue on blue kind of thing. We had agents that looked at particular parts of the battle space for information kind of things. And at the time, there was, People would come in and look at this and say, well, that's just great, but we command and control better than anybody else in the world. Why are we spending all of our time doing this? And so, and the folks in my staff would look at this and say, well, this isn't the way we do things back in the battalion. We do things this way, and you're now causing this thing to be much flatter. And it, it took many years before we institutionally came to the point that realized that, hey, this way of operating in kind of distributed manner like this you know, we sort of were forced into it in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and excelled at it. So um, so I guess that message is I'm an eternal optimist because it is hard and you get a lot of Sorry. scar tissue trying <laughs> to do this, but uh, it's not a reason not to. So, anyway. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, I want to ask you both, um, Secretary Work talked this morning about the, the sort of the mess that we're in and that one of the primary ways that 
that we're going to try to get out of it and or that is necessary irrespective of what happens to the mess is uh, this new innovation initiative, this offset strategy um, that is, uh, as of yet, uh, not not well defined. So I, I want to, A, see if I can get a little bit out of you on that. But assuming that that's not going to succeed. Um, We're probably going to let the uh, secretary and the deputy tell you might, about I it. Might, I was going to try and trick you, but I don't think I can do that. <laughs> so... Uh, but one of the things I think that was a, a theme in your comments, General Schmidl, was uh, the importance of experimentation yeah. and the role that that plays uh, in bridging the what what I would characterize as sort of the techno technical cultural divide. Um, so let me try here. Do you think that 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 <laughs> ought to be a feature of uh, this innovation? Um, Initiative that is being started to and what how critical is that? Do we have the structure in the department mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate the kind of activities uh, that are more like what General Schmidl outlined? You um, yeah, go ahead and I'll chime in. So, so I think that for openers, there's a there's a number of different layers at which we look at innovation and experimentation, right? So it starts at the at the highest levels in OSD, creating an atmosphere, and helping to resource these kinds of things. At the lowest level, though, where the actual experimentation really occurs is in many of the service labs. It's in many of the other laboratories, the private labs that are out there, and we we need to ensure that that continues and that they have the kinds of, um, of resources that they need to be able to experiment with that. I mean, I, I'm very, very confident that at the tactical level, the services are excited about this. The, the private and public labs that I've talked to are excited about this kind of experimentation. Um, it's just that we need to, I think, ensure that they are resourced. And again, I get back to this issue about you know, you got to kind of protect the creatives inside of a given organization. And there's some of you in this room here that have, have experiences that are similar to mine. And when you are sort of in a, on a different wavelength than a lot of the folks in your service, that can be good or bad, but it's necessary to protect and encourage people to do that and to think that way. And I think that, uh, you know, I mean, I applaud what Secretary Work is trying to do. I think it's, a, it's, it's it, innovation, looking at a technology offset strategy, whatever we're going to call it. We, that needs to just be, it's a core competency. It's not something we ought to layer on top of everything else, that we ought to build a budget at the end of it and say, hey, we ought to throw some money at R&D. No, I mean, this is, this is the core competency of what we do as a nation and what keeps us... Uh, moving forward, and, and and I applaud the fact that we're looking at it that way. I think that getting from that level all the way down to the to the level at which the services are experimenting or the labs are experimenting, um, we just got to push that, and we got to push it hard, and we got to and we have to encourage it. But uh, but I'm encouraged by the stuff that I see happening out there, whether it's in the Air Force or Red Flags or in the Marine Corps or the Navy or the Army. They're, they're doing a lot of that at that level, and it's, uh, you know, we just need to encourage more of it, to tell you the truth. So. Yeah. I, just to follow on, uh, you know, when I, I came to DARPA, I returned uh, as director in July of 2012. And um, what I found, I had been at DARPA very early in my career, 86 to 93. What I found was that uh, by 2012, having come through a number of years of um, getting in theater, working side by side with operational commanders, bringing some of the technologies that we thought might be able to help solve real problems, uh, but also listening and finding out what the real problems were, and then finding, in some cases, finding real solutions to those problems. What I found was an agency that was actually much better in 2012 at uh, bridging between crazy technology ideas and something that would make an operational impact than the agency I had been at, you know, two decades prior, which I found very encouraging. My concern was that, you know, really you have to be able to do this without being in an active war because otherwise it, that, that's not a good way to solve the problem. And my concern uh, was and remains that we, I think we don't really have um, the ability that we need to be healthy in the department to bridge between what is created in the 616263 Science and Tech Enterprise 
and actual operational capability when we're not in an active war, when we're preparing or when we want to deter a period adversary and we're working on a generational shift in those technologies, the, the, the question of experimentation, I think, is very much... Um, uh, it's something that's on our minds at DARPA. It's something I think that the mm. department's grappling with. How do you start doing the field trials, the early operational capability? How do you start showing that things work not just in a lab, mm -hmm. but in a, in a relevant operational context so that we can start moving where the dollars get spent within the services away from the way that we're doing business to the things that are going to be far more effective for the next generation? So I think that's, you know... that. It, that's just got to be core to anything that we do going forward. Um, well, if I could ask one other question before opening it up to everyone. Um, so there is uh, a, at least from the ground forces in particular, a strong emphasis on trying to better understand um, what the Army calls the human dimension, um, what, at, however you want to package it, the improved... Uh, ability to leverage, use technology to, to leverage uh, enhanced human performance. Uh, mm. And so I wondered if both of you could talk about from your respective positions um, what, sort of where we are in that, um, in that endeavor, what the potential implications are yeah. um, and, and how they relate to sort of more pure technology platform kinds of things. Um, I, and I just and I, the, the F thirty five might come up. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So if you could address that, that'd be you, great. you want to start off on yeah, some sure, of the technology start, stuff, and then, and then you, I'll get you, the implications. You'll do the F thirty five for sure. Um, <laughs> I mentioned biology, and the, uh, you know the most interesting species in biology is is us, right? So let's, so we let's think. well, certainly that's our view. Uh, I think we're actually right on that one. Um, uh, one branch of the work that we've been doing at DARPA is in neurotechnologies. Actually, began with with questions about restoring function. Uh, our revolutionizing prosthetics program, work that we're doing to repair the kind of memory loss uh, that often comes with PTSD. Uh, some of the other programs, but in as we set off down that path to restore function, and, and some of the things that are coming out of that are, I think, going to be very powerful for the restoration of function, but in, in the work that we're doing, as we learn more about the motor cortex, as we understand the, we hope to understand the, the sources of uh, neuropsychological, psychological disease, uh, as we understand some aspects of how memory works in the brain, all of those things that we're understanding from a restoration perspective, the learning also opens very interesting new doors into what might be possible uh, for, in some cases, the literal integration of human beings with technology. And, you know, if you step back and you think about how capable human beings are and how, how amazing human intelligence is, you think about the advances we've made in the last 40 or 50 years in um, the information realm and these incredibly complex systems that we, that warfighters today, their core job is, is interacting with and controlling and mastering and using these incredibly complex systems. But the interface between these two amazing capabilities is still a touch screen and a keyboard and a mouse. And um, how, how, how that uh, unfolds as we start understanding uh, how the brain interacts with complexity, I think. The potential is, is vast. That's why we pursue it. Uh, it absolutely raises all kinds of interesting questions that we as a society are going to need to deal with. Um, and, and I think you know, that's the nature of very powerful advanced technologies. I, want, I think it's important also to just offer a little bit of a caution. One thing I find is um, our military uh, partners and customers for our technology, and in particular the soft community, I think the appetite for anything that gives our human beings a little bit of an edge, it is such a big deal, it is so powerful, I think the appetite is enormous, and I think that, in fact, we, um, that makes me, in this case, it makes me slightly more cautious rather than more aggressive, because I think the burden falls on us to be completely clear about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, and I think that the, this is also an area that is 
uh, rife with the potential for getting carried away with ourselves because we want it so badly. So I would just offer a note of caution about that. After caffeine, I think we should sort of take a deep breath and think hard about what the next human performance enhancement is really going to be. Okay. So, so two things occur to me. One of them is that uh, along with the, uh, uh, with the caution that, that Arthur just uh, articulated, Things that we understand about the brain are not necessarily things that we understand about the person, about us. I mean, we are an embodied entity, right? And we are very, sus very subject to context and culture and the things that occur around us in determining what our behavior is and determining how we react to particular stimuli, if you will. So as we look at enhancements, performance enhancements, one of the things you could look at is the enhancements that have occurred, for example, in the world of professional sports over the last 30 years. If you look at films from the 1960s or 70s of NBA basketball players, and then you look at films today, you'll see a striking difference in technique, in speed, in everything that, that is about that. The same thing with any other, with any other sport. So, if that's the case, and we have the ability to, in, to, to increase our performance enhancement vis-a-vis -vis those kinds of motor skills, then the question remains, so how does that translate? Does it translate? How can it translate to our cognitive processes and our ability to be able to understand more of the environment, to understand it quicker? You know, we've always wanted as humans to be able to make better decisions faster and be smarter about it. I, I parachuted into an experiment years ago, and they were looking at trying to provide the commander of this organization with all this information. And the hypothesis was if he knew 10 times more than he knew before, he would make a better decision. So I was an observer in this thing for about three days, and what I discovered is that, in fact, what was happening is he was making decisions he was taking longer and longer and longer to make decisions as opposed to doing it quicker because once he became accustomed to all this information, he said, well, shoot, if I wait another five minutes, another three minutes, I'll know this much more. So as opposed to making a large number of smaller decisions, we found ourselves in a situation where we were making one big war-winning decision at the end of this, which was the exact opposite of what the hypothesis was for the experiment to start with. So. As we look at this, it's important, I think, for us to keep in mind that at the end of the day, it is all about us, and it's about the way we make decisions, and it's about the understanding the cognitive and social psychology that surrounds our decision-making right. processes and what we react to and how we react to those decisions. And, um, and so the physical enhancement of this is one piece of it. So we can carry more, we can run faster, we can jump higher. Maybe we can even stay up. Maybe we don't have to sleep for days at a time and still retain some cognitive capability. Um, I don't know what all that could entail, but at the end of the day, it, it's our understanding how we make decisions. One of the things I was monkeying around with years ago was trying to get these algorithmic agents to make all these housekeeping decisions about numbers of things. I didn't want the, any of my staff to be involved in trying to calculate the number of tons of fuel that had, that we could find other things to do that. What I wanted them to calculate was why is that unit X using so much more fuel than unit Y? Is, is, is there a reason for that? And if there is, let's understand it and see if there's something there that we need to change or not change. So, um, I, I mean, I, I'm absolutely with you, Arthur. I, 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 the, the technology revolution and human enhancement is something that's staring us in the face right now, but it's been kind of sneaking up on us for a couple of years. But I think that if, we, if you look if you're looking for a place to, to, to use as a model, if you look at the enhancement of, in the world of professional sports and then just see where, I mean, just, just watch somebody dribble in a 1960s Lakers team as opposed to what you see today. It's really quite impressive, the difference. And so we, we can get there. The question is, how do we get the decision-making capabilities, the cognitive abilities, because ultimately we are social creatures, I believe, and... Uh, our culture has, and context has a great deal to do with what we uh, decide and how we decide to do it. So, okay, I agree. Thanks. Okay, so um, I've got a hand up over here, and then we'll go up here. If people again could raise their hands, they'll bring the mic, um, and if you could briefly identify yourself before asking your question. Great.
Great, thank you, wonderful discussion. Uh, Doug Brooks from the International Stability Operations Association. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I always pictured DARPA as a bunch of 20-something-year-olds sitting around dropping heroin and coming up with ideas. <laughs> don't, don't, please don't dispel that. Um, but my question is, is you're no, now working... the answer is no, just to be clear. <laughs> My question is now, of course, you have to work with non-traditional contracting contractors and the non-traditional contracting community with Silicon Valley a lot more than, than you know, the, the old contractors and so on. How is that going to impact uh, um, OPSEC? How is it going to impact on, on how the development is done when you're working with people who have never had to work with the Department of Defense before and uh, coming up with all sorts of wacky ideas that maybe you don't want to leak out? So. Uh, you know, there's, I, I find nothing really new about the communities that we need to work with and are working with. Um, it's it, it, all the way back through DARPA's history, we've had work that focused on uh, things that were directly tied to, to clear military need and systems and that would transition to the services. And almost always that is done working with the traditional defense contractor base because they're the ones that are going to carry it forward. But again, throughout many decades of history, we've also had these enabling technology investments that ARPANET that led to internet, the microelectronics and RF semiconductors and MEMS revolutions, all, all the groundwork that got laid, we made those investments because we needed it for the national security capabilities. But of course, many of those technologies have also built massive industries and changed how we live and work. And the nature of that work has, has historically and continues to be that we work with universities and companies of all sorts, including those who don't consider themselves part of, of the defense contractor community. Uh, so I don't really see a big change, but your question is still completely relevant. I, I will tell you that the way I think about it is that our work is a uh, portfolio of, um, of programs. At the moment, for example, we've got about 200 active programs at DARPA. Some of those in the portfolio um, need to be classified and need to be done in a very controlled fashion. But I, many of them actually need to create this foment in, uh, and generate new technology revolutions that will happen in a very public way. And the, many of them actually will need to get commercialized before we can harvest them for DOD. That was certainly true of the information revolution. I think it's true today in robotics as an example. Um, so, so not only do we uh, not worry about keeping them classified, we actually want them out in the world. We recently established an open catalog as an example where um, uh, much of our published research is uh, widely available where a lot of the software tools that we're building uh, that are open source are available. And I was pleasantly surprised by the reaction that we got from some of our military customers and partners. I thought they might be worried about OPSEC, but in fact they said, thank God, we can never actually get our hands on anything. Now I can just go to this public website and get this piece that I need, and then I can go build the, the protected capability that I want to build. So it's an ongoing question, but that's how we think about it. So I think here, and then we've got over there, and then I, I, and then there, and that. So, so here first, right here. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, it sounds a great deal as if we're looking at capabilities that will merge uh, data fusion efforts, uh, cyber kinetics, or whatever we're going to call them. Um, does this lead, are, are we finally going to be abandoning the sort of industrial warfare, electronic, you know, older electronic warfare, and moving to at least sort of commando versions of, uh, I don't know if we want to call them boosted people, but uh, augmented by, you know, things like the data fusion engine the F-35 is going to have, um, where humans uh, aren't as important in terms of lugging enormous amounts of equipment, but can make decisions and redirect other weapons. Well, so let me, let me tackle the, the fusion piece first. So I think the, the issues about data fusion are this fundamentally the same kinds of things that I was trying to get at years ago, which is that if you can fuse data, if you can have... Uh, data fusion capabilities that are able to that are that are 
technologies that are able to fuse the kinds of data that you would want to present to a decision maker to make a decision. The important thing is that the decision maker has some say over what that information is and how it's presented. Um, when you talked about the industrial age piece of that, I mean, like anything else, I mean, that's going to take years and years of transition. But I would suggest that one of the things that we can see today in the in the world of cyber, for example, and in other venues, is the blurring of offense and defense. And, and I think that we have historically looked at those two things as, you know, conceptually as two different things. We don't operate that way. I mean, you don't have an offense and a defense inside of an operations center, but you conceptually think about, for example, for traditionally, in the offense, we would command and control very much uh, hands off, and you would allow units to go and do things that they needed to do, um, mission type orders, I mean, and that kind of thing. Whereas on the defensive side, it was a tendency to have a more centralized command and control because you were trying to uh, influence, if you will, a smaller piece of space or time. But I think that that is blurred, and I think that the the notion that you can ever be on the offense without being on the defense in at least the same uh, sense of, of of effort is is gone. I mean, in the world of cyber, I think it's naive to think that you can do things uh, you, that you can do anything without having both of those things in mind and being giving equal shrift to both of them and realizing that there's a real fuzzy line between offense and defense. In not only conceptually, but in terms of execution. So, so I think that that's ultimately where this is going, that that line is going to, be, is going to break down. Um, but like anything else, it's going to take years. This, the industrial layered mine, I mean, that developed because it's easy for us to understand that kind of hierarchical uh, sort of, uh, you know, this, you know, the Newtonian linear based the way things are, even though we instinctively and intuitively know that that's generally not the case. Um, even our buddy Clausewitz, that is accused of being that way, has, says that he, he, when he talks about Napoleon, he starts talking about genius because he can't figure out any other way to explain <laughs> how he did what he did at Jena or Auschwitz or where or that. So, anyway. That's great. Okay. Uh, there, sorry. Yep. Right there. Um. Is that on? Yes. Hi, thank you. It's really interesting to listen to you. Um, my name is Hannah Roslin. I'm a research professor at the Norwegian Cyber Defense Academy and a visiting fellow here at CSIS. Um, and you talk uh, a lot about, you know, that, that how technology changes people. It obviously changes how we are, what it means to be human. And I see with our students as well, uh, the young cyber officers and the, those uh, training to be cyber professionals they cognitively relate to technology in a very different way than their superiors do. Uh, they just use it differently. They think about it differently. Um, they don't necessarily even understand when their superiors try to explain technology, the language they use. We lack some... We have a challenge of finding a common language, actually, that we can... That their superiors in, say, 50s, 60s try to explain military technology. And you see that the 19, 20-year-olds, they don't necessarily understand. Um, so there is, and also inside the military, there's a p potential friction between the, uh, you know, the tech-savvy skill set that they have and the military hierarchy, because they at the same time lack military experience, military know-how. Um, we have obviously our challenges in how to deal with this. I would just, it's so interesting to listening to you, so I was hoping you could comment on how the US military will relate to the challenge of incorporating that Ah, uh, skill set of uh, the youngsters of today. Thank you. I would just say that's how revolution happens. Sometimes it's a generational shift, and we we're seeing it exactly the way you described. Uh, one simple example is we've been working on. Um, uh, it's a robotic, essentially a robotic mule. The question is, can we help Marines with the load that they have to carry? Uh, it, it, just to be very clear, this is not something that's going to transition in the Marine Corps in the next 20 minutes. Really what we're trying to do is give them an example of a robotic capability so that we and they can explore together how real human beings will interact with these machines. And, you know, we have all the PowerPoint conversations and, and we all have these sort of theoretical conversations. And then we get it in the hands of actual young Marines and they are all over it and they are interacting with this technology in a way that's 
completely natural to them. And so they're going to tell us. Right? We're not going to tell them. And I think that's the way it should be, and it's, it's good and constructive. So, so one of the things that, that uh, I noticed... As a 40-year-old that used to try to explain this that, to youngsters, yeah. how do you deal with it? Well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so one of the things that, that I noticed when we first started doing a number of these experiments, this was back you know, 10, 15 years ago, with what was then very nascent sort of computerization and, and uh, uh, interfaces, if you will, the human GUI, they used to call it the interfaces, is that we folks in my generation would get very frustrated when the thing didn't work the way it was supposed to. And what I noticed is that the youngsters didn't get frustrated at all. They would just sit there and say, oh, okay, I guess that didn't work, and they'd go do something else. And I'm ready to take this device and, like, throw it as hard as I can against the wall. So th there clearly is a difference in, in that, and, and you're absolutely right. There also is a difference in the way the technology is presented to you, the information is presented. We have noticed that there are different pathways, neural pathways, that, that, that we are using as, in trying to understand that. So we, there's a couple of ways that we can go about doing that. Somebody asked a question before about some different kinds of... Um, of uh, contra uh, research folks. And so a number of years ago, I hired this guy who was a brilliant, brilliant uh, man. He had a, two degrees, one in philosophy and one in neuroscience. And I brought him into the command center, and I wanted him to talk to us about information displays and show us how this, did, how other ways to think about this. And uh, he had a, a, a full-on ponytail, I mean, doing his best Jerry Garcia imitation. He wore tie-dyed shirts all the time. And my captain, as I was a colonel at the time, used to call him Dr. Tie-Dye. And, and he, he was out there. He was way out there. And he was awesome because he came in and he looked at our way we were displaying this information, and it was all the way that, that we'd done it for many years on maps, you know, with this called 2507, whatever the hell, the technology that we used to display. This is what a tank looks like. And it's a square box with an X through it and something squiggly on the top, and you go, how the hell does that look like a tank? It's like a foreign. So he had another way to display this information. And it was a picture, literally, it looked like the Starship Enterprise. And uh, the engines would, would, would heat up and, and, and their colors would change based on what the enemy was doing. And we never did get there. But it was a phenomenal way to look at this. And where we did get to was picturing things as opposed to having a, 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 a symbol that required another... Yeah. Okay, I know what that is. Now I, I'm going to do something else as opposed to a picture of a tank. What I think we're seeing today with a lot of the technologies is that because they're using different pathways, because they are taking this in differently, Arthur's absolutely right. This has got to come from the bottom up again. And I think that the hardest thing for, the, the, for other generations to do is to let go. I mean, we just talked about hierarchies, right? And it's just so hard to let go. And it's hard to let go in a way that, that not only do you put up with that behavior, but you encourage it. Because you know the institution has got to have that kind of blood in it if it's going to continue and if it's going to get better and if it's going to survive. So, I mean, you've, you've hit on, on the, the challenge for us in the leadership role, at least the way I see it, is, is to understand enough about the technology and enough about the way they're using the technology. I go back to what I said earlier. Why would we be surprised that ISIS would use the? Why would why would that surprise us at all? It shouldn't have even. We should have been surprised if they didn't. So just you know. Okay, I don't want to give short shrift to this side of the room, but okay, all the questions. All are, the hands are we'll here. Go right here, and then we'll go in the back back there. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> Hi, David Scruggs, Renaissance Street Chief Advisors. My question was just about when of the three main themes that DARPA is working on today. The first one you mentioned about fundamentally rethinking complex systems. Can you give a little more color on that? Sure. Can you give a couple of sub-themes? And are we talking about just platforms? Uh, a lot of it is platforms, but it's not limited to platforms. Let me give you maybe two examples uh, that are a little bit different. Um, uh, space. We are, everything that we do militarily that gives us overwhelming advantage is critically dependent on space, whether it's for position navigation and timing with GPS or communications or ISR, everything. And I think it has become, you know, it's just something that comes to you from above and people sort of take it for granted, but we're dead without it. Uh, we don't control space the way that we used to, and um, not only because of other nations' aspirations and actions, but also because of what's happening commercially 
uh, on orbit. Um, our paradigm for space, for, all for good reasons, we have now arrived at a place where the way we access space is we build a phenomenally massive, expensive satellite. We put it on a phenomenally expensive rocket. It takes a couple of years, sometimes I take longer than that, to schedule a launch. Uh, and then, then you got what you got. And, and it, we are incredibly inflexible. Uh, and there are things that we need to be able to do from orbit that we simply can't even do that way. So uh, our question is, can we completely rethink that? Can we uh, change the way that we do launch a couple of our programs, aim to dramatically reduce the cost of uh, launch to a low Earth orbit? Uh, the cost is, I think, important, but actually even more impactful with these programs would be achieving 24-hour call-up so that you could go from any airfield uh, around the world on a day's notice and be able to get something on orbit, that would be a major change. And that, coupled with what is already happening with small sats, including commercial activity, you can start to see how those, uh, that's already, you know, I think there's a lot of momentum there. If we can add the launch piece, that starts changing it in a fundamental way. When you start having those new technology capabilities, then you can start thinking about new architectures to do the jobs that you've thought about doing on orbit and think about what's possible now from the cooperative actions of multiple satellites. Um, th so that, that's one example. A very different example might be uh, thinking about how we uh, operate in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, again, we have these massive um, uh, AESA arrays. They are the envy of the world. They're they're, they're really pretty awesome what we can do, uh, but uh, because they take so long to develop and because their capabilities are fixed, uh, when the adversary uses commercially available technology, literally that they can buy with a few clicks from a keyboard, uh, to come up with uh, missiles that might threaten our capabilities. Uh, we, you know, when we go back to the drawing board, it can be a 15-year block upgrade cycle. It, you know, we might get lucky, and it's just something that takes a few months to go you know, diddle around with the algorithms. But neither of those is adequate for the world in which we need to be able to know in real time in the battlefield what's going on and adapt and, and, and achieve the control of the electromagnetic spectrum that we want. So finding ways to do that. Um, the, the underlying technology is so powerful and the advances that are still, that we, that we see in the lab are so far beyond even our impressive capabilities in the field. Our question is, instead of just continuing to build big monolithic systems with those lab capabilities, can that next generation be distributed coherent systems that would give us the ability to um, you know, have not one monolithic target, but have this very uh, graceful degradation, have, the in have it make it much harder for the adversary to know where the electromagnetic radiation is coming from, uh, a capability that can be upgraded much more gradually, much more gracefully and quickly over time. So those are. Uh, so I think it's a it's a general concept, but how you really uh, implement it is going to be different depending on the specific domain and the challenges. In the back over there, and then we'll go there, and then back there. right here in the back row, right there. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, extremely informative. Uh, I have two-part question. One, uh, what do you want the American public to know about this remarkable description that you've given us today, and how would you do that? Will you go on the news hour? Will you get interviewed by Charlie Rose? Uh, it's supposed to be an open-ended <laughs> okay. question. Second part uh, relates to our allies. Uh, Japan, Germany, England, whom, uh, UK rather, uh, whomever. Is, are there DARPA equivalents out there that you'd like to tell us about that we partner with to the extent that you can discuss that? Um, let's see. So uh, I, I think we try very hard to get the story out about what we're trying to create in the future for a couple of reasons. One is simply because, you know, DARPA is 200 government employees in, a, in an office building in Arlington, Virginia. So we don't do anything without engaging. 200 government employees, right? Uh, because all of the work gets done in this, you know, we tap the, the, the intellectual smarts in this vast technological community, uh, which means we have to be able to tell them 
where we're going if we're going to get their engagement. So uh, we, we try very hard to get the word out. But also because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter unless we get a transition to operational capability. And you know that's why I, I'm particularly enthusiastic about the fact that the department is working on how we're going to get better at moving technology from the innovation stage to actual operational capability. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, other, uh, you know, a lot of our focus tends to be on working with the technical community. We occasionally will will do something in other countries or with other agencies in other countries, but that's not our primary focus. Um, virtually every um, major defense uh, actor around the world has a has an R and D capability of some sort. There have been some of them have some resemblance to DARPA, but I, there's not really a one-to-one -one map, I would say. Can I follow up on that and ask a little bit about your relationships with IARPA and sure. the DHS? I don't know what the DHS version of, but I know they have one as well. So the interagency ARPAs, um, how you interface with them? Yeah, just whenever there's an opportunity that we're working on together, I, you know, of the um, of the organizations that have ARPA in the name, they're they're doing a variety of different things. Uh, HS ARPA is not, you know, doesn't particularly have a mission that resembles what we're doing. Um, ARPA E in the Energy Department is actually the one that is probably the closest to having the ARPA like model of, you know, a deep focus on breakthrough technologies and understanding that they're in the revolution business and. Um, you know, being tolerant of risk and being willing to fail in order to reach far ahead. But I think that's actually a great thing to see different parts of, of government nurturing, but I think it's implemented in very different ways in different parts of the government. You know, if I could respond to your comment about the allies before, it's, uh, it's been my experience that when we look at how some of these technologies and concepts would transition into the services or into the way that we actually do the war fighting part of this, mm -hmm. There is a, a great deal of interest on the part of the Allies, and, and many of them are very involved in this for a number of reasons. One is technical. They want to keep up with us so they can stay connected and plugged into what we do. And the other is conceptual. They want to know why we're thinking about fighting wars differently and what we think is, is important in this. So there, there actually is a very rich dialogue that goes on here, and, uh, and it's made richer because the Allies all bring a different perspective to this than we do. And we sometimes forget that the way we do things <clears throat> is not necessarily the way the rest of the world does things. And people view us differently, obviously, than we view ourselves. So uh, it, at least you know, at, at the tactical level, from what I've seen, it's been a very healthy relationship. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that, as Arthi said, there's other connections that, uh, that, that also enrich in that relationship. So. Okay. I think I, uh, I, had, I, I promised some in this, on this side, and now I've lost them. Uh, there and then in the back right there. Thanks. Um, thank you all both for, thank you all for this amazing discussion. This, I'm Matt Jones from the Boeing Company. And just wanted to ask, first of all, thank you, um, Dr. Prabhakar, for alluding to Alasa and XS1. I hope those are successful. You um, have to make them work now. That's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, ever since World War II, um, I would argue the U.S. has enjoy technological superiority or at least parity with potential adversaries. And we've been happy to invest heavily for that. The world has changed a bit. Not several changes you've alluded to, um, the rapid acceleration of the pace of technological advancement, the rapid proliferation of technological advancement and know-how around the world and closer to home, as we discussed downstairs. Um, we're in a fiscal austerity period for defense spending that is could arguably last longer than typical downturns have. Given those, um, how do you see DARPA and the department dealing with that cost imposition culture that we've accepted to get to that technological spirit for so long? We probably can't afford that. We can't afford to spend whatever it costs. You mean where we impose costs on ourselves? Yes. Yeah. So how, are, how are we addressing that both technologically in your organization and general culturally in the services to start thinking about how can we do great stuff for a lot less money um, just as a, as a just a way of yeah. not accepting that we're always going to be able to just spend our way out of uh, any kind of technological threat? Yeah, I'll just say I think that that is the one of the core underpinnings of the work that we're doing in rethinking complex systems because 
for a lot of reasons, the, the cost issue that you mentioned, but also simply because of the power that we're going to be able to achieve by going down this traditional path of, of big monolithic systems. I think we're just out of steam on that. Um, th coupled in with that, I, I, I think it, what's topical today is to talk about defense downturn and sequestration. Step back one more step, and if, if you look at the investment that this country in the United States that we make in research and development, uh, today one-third of that comes from the federal government and two-thirds of that comes from the private sector. Uh, it's not that long ago. It's only a few decades ago that that, 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 that that national investment was dominated by public sector spending. Now, public sector investment in R&D has plus or minus kept pace with GDP. It sort of bubbled along and grown at about the rate of GDP, declined a little bit. Private sector investment in R&D has grown faster than GDP. That, I mean, that is the innovation economy that we're, we're all very aware of. That's what that means. And it, to me, there's a much more fundamental structural shift that has happened, and it's about the fact that technology is, you know, happily, right? I mean, in DOD, we think, oh, this is really bad news because we're not in charge of this anymore. In fact, this is good for humanity, that technology is being driven for these, for these market reasons and to improve lives around the world. Uh, but it means that we, we is exactly what you said. We don't, not only do we not have technological parity, but what's available to anyone around the world, nation, state, or individual, uh, at the tap of the keyboard is phenomenal technological capability. And I think we are self-impeding uh, in, in our lack of ability to grab it and use it and run harder and faster than anyone else. Uh, that's That's the thing that... Uh, I, I think is uh, that's the piece of the puzzle that the technology community needs to take on. Many other issues about acquisition and Congress and the requirements process, all of those are real. But the part that the technology community has to take ownership of is can we come up with new architectures, new, way of, new ways of thinking about complex systems that allow us to tap that very powerful commercial technology and the pace at which it moves. So I, think, I think if you look at the... One of the, the, the interesting things that uh, you discover when you look at the history of, say, the last 100 years or so, is that a lot of the military innovation that we celebrate occurred in periods of economic downturn and in periods of austerity. And, and I think that, that's, uh, that, that that occurs, I mean, there's all kinds of examples, but the, I think a lot of that occurs because there's a natural tension that develops and tension is good. Tension is what breeds creativity. It's what breeds these kinds of thoughts. And so I think that there, there actually is something to be said for the opportunities that exist even, even in, a, in an economic downturn. With regard to the technologies, one of the challenges, and Arthur mentioned at the end here, is that once you, as a service, when you make a decision that you're going to start to transition something into, into a, a long-term program, the, the the, the art in that is to ensure that there is still room for innovation in that program as it goes forward because the technology is advancing so much faster in leaps and bounds than it did even 20 or 25 years ago that for us to lock something in and say, okay, this is going to be what we're going to use to fight for the next X number of years, whatever that happens to be, we may find it to be outdated shortly after that or we may find that we don't have the ability to change it in a way that keeps up with the, the way the technology and the way that the, that the, uh, that the um, industry, if you will, is, is changing. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of a, I am a glass half full sort of fellow in this regard because I do think there are some opportunities out there for us to think and, and to leverage some of the commercial technologies that are, uh, and we spent many years back in the 90s with no money using COTS equipment that we literally bought it at, uh, you know, at the commercial marketplace down the street and took it out in the field and saw it, see if it can work. Can we make this do something? Can we run, can we do combined arms, you know, uh, sorts of uh, operations with this technology? And the answer was, yes, we could. Um, so, and it, you know, years later, it found its way into the normal system, right. so... Right here. Hi there, Scott Augenbaugh, CSIS. Uh, I had a question sort of going back to a lot of the themes you've talked about. You've talked about data, you've talked about 
uh, knowledge filtering, um, and culture. And so one of the things I wanted to ask is, as you look out over the next 10 or 15 years, and you look at an increase in data, and thanks for releasing those X data tools. That's a great catalog project at DARPA. Um, the graphical inter interface hasn't really changed. Um, we've added new things to it, like voice communication, heads-up displays, and there, we've made improvements in some of these technologies, but it hasn't really changed the game enough. Um, and if you look at pilots and all sorts of military leaders going forward, they're gonna have so much information coming at them. I guess the question I have here in this space is, Culturally, I'm not sure if the US and many other countries are reg ready for algorithms and robots to be sort of the leaders in the battlefield going forward. And I was wondering to that extent, how much are you thinking about the cultural aspect of some of the changes by adding more algorithms and more computational models that provide a more autonomous fleet uh, going forward? And culturally, what that will do in terms of the job losses that'll likely occur in that same time period. Mm. Yeah. Well, I don't, first of all, I don't think about algorithms and robots as leaders, right? I mean, that's yeah. actually, that's the thing that human beings are going to still be the best at. So uh, just, to, just to nitpick with your language sure. a little bit. Um, you know, I want to make a really important distinction between, uh, we, we use the term autonomy often uh, to mean a whole host of things. So let me separate two pieces of it. One is over time, what machines and systems are capable of doing. And in fact, as we know, technology is progressing at this phenomenal pace, and yet capability is, is, is advancing quickly, can continue to advance into the next decades. The, the separate question of autonomy is a question about rules of engagement, and it's a question that applies to the autonomy that we give to the humans involved in war fighting, as well as about the machines that are involved in war fighting. And, and I, I think it's important to make that distinction because I think it's going to help us ask a higher quality question when we, when we deal with those kinds of societal choices that you're talking about. Because uh, I, I want us to have that debate, but I want us to have a really smart debate about it uh, and not a Hollywood debate about you know, Terminator, right? So if you do that, I think what I would tell you is my objective is, on the one hand, to build the technology capabilities that are increasingly powerful, because I think that is the only way that we're going to get ahead of the threat that, that we are dealing with enabled by global technology. Uh, but with that, it's going to be, uh, I want to build into the technology the ability for the human, for the warfighter, to, to choose the degree of autonomy that they, that they confer to the technology, depending on the situation and the needs of the moment, and and that that uh, that control structure, I think, is actually uh, needs to be core to how we think about how we use uh, the continuing performance capabilities of the technology. So, I, so I think that first of all, I, I violently agree with what Arthur just said. When you mentioned that thing about algorithms and autonomous, this. We need to remember that we're the ones that develop those algorithms. We're the ones that empower those kinds of things to do the things that they do. It actually brings up a larger ethical question if you start to talk about that, and, and that is if you, are, if you are trying to give to some kind of autonomous agent, if you will, some ability to make decisions based on these algorithms you've given it, on things in the battle space, we probably need to, under, to try to understand what we are basing, what worldview we're using to base those decision, that decision matrix on. And I'll give you an example. If you believe, for example, that there is one answer to every question, and that answer is out there. It's out there. It's an objective answer. It's waiting for us to find it and determine, and that is, that, that's it. If you believe that, then you are going to program those algorithms to try to find that one answer. In, in amongst all of that noise. On the other hand, if you believe that there's a more relativistic added, uh, aspect of how you make decisions because you take into account the context, the culture, all the other things that are out there, then you're going to build an algorithm that's going to try to understand all of those things. So when you take <clears throat> and you have a pilot in a cockpit that's doing close air support and everything about the target he's getting ready to hit, he's met all the requirements, all the objective requirements, yet when he rolls in, he looks at it and something is just not right and he doesn't drop. And it's understanding what that just not right thing is. Do we want that to be part of a, of a, of a decision matrix? And if we do, how are we going to develop and program the things to do that? So as 
as you think about that, I, I think there's a lot more that we need to bring into account here, other than just the technology, to go back to trying to understand how we make moral choices, ethical choices, how we do those things as humans, and understanding ourselves a little better. So just a thought. Well, I uh, thank you both for what I knew would be a very rich conversation. Um, I, to me, my I guess my big takeaway, at least at first blush, is innovation is really hard because it starts with people and ends with people. Um, and we're really hard. Um, that's right. But that's so, also but the best part. That is the best that, part. Right? And, that, and also that there is a lot of promise and some amount of risk. Yep. And how yeah. we as people find our way through this is uh, perhaps the challenge of the day. So um, very grateful to both of you for a wonderful discussion. And good luck in leading us through all of this. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for today. having us. Thank you for it. Again, if people could take the elevators down to the concourse level, you can get food there.